All right. So, hello. My name is Forrest Anderson. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about open source. Um, not necessarily too much on how to get into open source, but rather some of the dynamics um, and team aspects behind a lot of uh, different types of projects that you might not see from the surface. So, uh, what I'm going to try to cover is a lot of my experiences in working in the open source field. And hopefully some of this stuff uh, might, you might be able to take to your own jobs. Uh, you might be able to take to your own open source projects or even your school projects. Um, something I really want to go over is just kind of walking through the open source ecosystem so you guys can kind of see uh, what goes on there. Um, and then also take a look at some alternate views on how we do teamwork with other companies. Um, so myself, um, as Mike mentioned, he gave basically my entire bio. Uh, so I'm a fourth year student at Carleton, I'm actually in my fifth year, but it's actually my fourth year at QSEC, so that's super cool. I'm super honored to be here this year as a presenter. Um, I'm the CTO of a small startup in Ottawa called Timsel, which Mike mentioned, but what he didn't mention is that it's two people and it's like super small, so we're not like anything big. But, um, I'm also the co-lead of a security competition in Ottawa called Hack All of Things, as well as uh, a game jam called The Lame Jam. Um, and I'm the meta lead of Valoran. And so Valoran um, is an open source game uh, that I've been contrib contributing to for approximately a year now. Um, and since it's an open source game, we're able to do a lot of really cool stuff that you can't really find in many AAA games because they don't have the time and resources to do it. So we're doing like, a lot of cool research in world simulation, uh, world generation, erosion, and stuff that uh, you likely wouldn't see other places. And so uh, Valoran, it's built in Rust. Uh, there's like a pretty big bio that I could give for it, but the easiest way to describe it is it's just Minecraft++. Plus um, Plus. It was created about almost two years ago now, uh, so I hopped on right as we were switching from the first engine to the second engine. So on Valorant, we have approximately 15 core developers, and so my definition of core developer is someone who will come back about once a month and put in some progress, um, but we have over 90 recorded contributors on the current version of Valorant. Um, so myself, as I mentioned, I'm the meta lead. So what this uh, consists of is a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily see in the game. And so uh, a lot of stuff to do with like meetings and uh, sort of forming how teams work and stuff like that. Uh, also a really big thing that I do is write a weekly dev blog that focuses on some progress that was made each week in the game. Um, and I work a lot with uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment, um, as well as helping anybody who needs uh, to get on uh, Git or anything like that. So I'll go over the definition of what I consider to be a healthy uh, project because it's very different whether you're at a company or whether you're working on something on your own. But one of the most important things, in my opinion, is sustainable development. And so the idea behind this is that you can have contributors that can come and work on the project, um, do a task, and then be able to continue without too much um, issue. But also at the same time, like you want people coming back, you want uh, contributors who can keep working on stuff, but you really need to also make sure that they're healthy and they're not burning out. So I'm going to go through a couple different things uh, that I've found with Valoran that hopefully you can take away to other projects, but things that are especially like related to open source in particular. So the first thing I want to go over is making it an easy process for new people to join. And so for many of you out here, um, I, I didn't do I didn't start open source until like last year, and so it was very difficult for me to understand how to hop onto a project like this. And so for beginners, um, some of the things that we try to do. Uh, is really help beginners get on board because the code base is very large. It can be very difficult to go in and look at a Rust project, understand what's going on, and be able to make effective changes. And so what we do is, uh, well, we use Discord to be able to communicate with everybody. And we have a lot of channels available to any beginners that can, so they can ask questions about uh, different parts of the platform, about anything that they're running into. Um, and then we also try to do a lot of peer programming. So we have a lot of core developers, people who know the engine quite well, and pairing them up with people who are new but interested in working on the project is a really great way for the beginners to be able to get onto the same uh, level as some of the core developers, or at least more familiar with certain parts of the system. Um, another part that I'll discuss a little bit more later is the idea of beginner tasks and beginner issues. Um, and so this is the idea of just making uh, issues available, like if there's something easy that a core developer can do, they can instead make it into a issue for a beginner, and this gives them the opportunity to become familiar with a certain part of the code base. And then finally, a uh, detailed code review is a really big one, because if you are a beginner and you're putting your code in and it just kind of gets accepted, that's not going to really help you too much, but if people are really criticizing how you're, doing, how you're writing your code, um, how it interacts with the code base, where certain things might be a problem, then that's where you can get a lot of really great community interactions that help 
uh, augment uh, the, the code base. Um, so that's for beginners. Now the second part is for experts. So this is super important because if someone uh, finds out about your project and is an expert in a specific domain, it's, in, it's essential that they, uh, they can get exactly where they need to to work on your project as soon as possible. And you can't really expect them to be there for a long time. Maybe they just want to implement one thing. But the most important thing is that what they're implementing is going to take you or your developers significantly longer than they are able to. Or maybe they're going to implement something that you have no idea how to do or something like that. So you need to make sure that the lines of communication to these uh, like between you and these uh, VIPs is like always there. You also need to make sure that uh, they get any support that they need. So next up, I'm going to discuss communication. This is a super big thing. Um, so because uh, bad, communica bad communication can come up quite easily, it's very easy for um, people anonymous on the internet to uh, say stuff that uh, it, it is like can be really taken out of context. And also, there can be language barriers. Since you're working with people from around the world, a lot of stuff might be misunderstood uh, in ways that you don't want. And so the way that we work on moderating communication um, is a really proactive approach. So we, uh, our community leaders will try their best to make sure that uh, any issues that come up are resolved before they escalate too hard. Um, and one really big thing to point out is that toxicity is always a deterrent. No matter how good a programmer is, if they're being toxic, it's incredibly important uh, that they are called out for it. We've seen this a couple of times with some really experienced people, but the way that they interact with the community is incredibly detrimental. So we've had to um, really have some hard talks with them. Um, next up, let's take a look at like, deciding how to iterate on top of ideas that you have as a project. So one of the big things about open source is that consensus is very difficult. Everybody has like a different idea of what they want the project to be. Um, and at Learn, with Learn, we don't explicitly have any project leads uh, that control decisions. And so um, we do a couple of things to help us out. So the first one is have regular meetings. Um, that helps out a lot to get everybody on the same page. But the second thing is using a good RFC format. So RFC stands for Request for Comments. And this has a lot to do with uh, how we structure uh, meetings so that we can um, come up with a concrete decision afterwards that people are able to comment on and discuss much, e much more easily like that. And then another thing that we uh, try to do is delegate work. So as I was mentioning, core developers shouldn't be working on easy stuff. That should go to, uh, to other developers. So uh, uh, another way that we do this is with working groups. Um, so with a working group, the idea is that certain uh, focuses can be designated into their own groups, and then within their tasks can be passed uh, from the leaders to um, other people. So next up, this is a pretty big one, keep in touch with the community. Um, an open source project is available to anybody to check out, but it can be very difficult to dive right into the code base, um, and most people won't want to do that. So a couple of ways that I've already mentioned, so we do blogging, um, that's a really great way to get everybody on the same page from the opinions of the developers. On top of that, you can do like social media, um, getting the community to contribute to ideas is also really good, so if you forums once in a while, getting responses. Um, and another really big thing is managing expectations. So for the people who are going to be using your end product, you want to make sure that they can expect um, the stuff from you at a, uh, at a certain point. So for example, have standard release cycles. Um, we're also working really hard to get a future roadmap set up so people can know what to expect at what time. Um, and this is something that is much more difficult for other um, entities in the game industry as well as other companies as well, I think. And finally, I just want to um, cover a couple of things that really separates open source from the corporate world. So the first big thing is that open source is not a company. So there's a lot of really big differences that you'll find. Burnout is very real with open source because people aren't getting paid to do this, and so they're doing it in the relaxation time. But it can be very difficult to separate the relaxation time from the time that you're working on open source. So while people might leave the project, we do our very best to make sure that they're always welcome back and make that transition as easy as possible for them. Because people have stuff that comes up in their life. Um, that can be quite difficult. Um, and then also uh, motivate the team. This is a really big one because, again, your team is working purely from the passion that they have. It's really important to reward them for the work that they do. And so this can be uh, just talking about the stuff that they're doing inside the blog, talking about it at meetings. But for a lot of people, the recognition, they don't want a ton of recognition all over the world, but they just want to know that people appreciate their work. So finally, uh, I just want to quickly discuss uh, what can you do to uh, sort of um, work with this uh, type of paradigm? So going out into the world and contributing more to the stuff that you find really interesting. So uh, for myself, 
what really got me into open source. So I'm wearing a Hacktoberfest shirt right now. And so this is an event that takes place every October. If you submit four pull requests to open source repositories, you'll get a sweet t-shirts and stickers as well. Um, so this is a really great opportunity because a lot of repositories will do their very best to uh, make issues that are available for beginners. And so uh, this is probably the best way that you can sort of, like, or the best time of year, the best culture around it, I think. But that being said, uh, the other thing that I always recommend uh, well, actually, sort of, it's like an inspirational quote, which I feel like I need to put it in. So, CME Filoni, so this is from Robots, and it really hit me really hard, and I, I really appreciate it because I think the idea behind open source is that you see something that you know how to fix, and you can go and do it, but it's a problem. And so, with the open source mindset, you could just go out and do it. And so, um, yeah, I'll leave you with that. That's pretty much it. So, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Really